Hello, listeners, subscribers, and wanderers to our Vale of Smoke and Gold podcast. Welcome. I'm your host, Annalise, and this is part two of our Kelpies episode series. It is also the final part. If you haven't listened to part one, please go back and do so now. In part one, we discussed Kelpie origins, first writings, and role in history. Their nature, or personality, and physical characteristics and abilities. Kelpie magical characteristics and abilities. their relationship to their habitats, homes, and other fairy folk, and their relationship to humans, and how you can potentially lure, trap, capture, or repel them. We also began the episode with our first story, Per the usual. In this episode, part two, we'll be discussing a second story, then analyzing the Kelpie itself, as well as the stories that were mentioned in this episode and part one. And then on to my personal magic section, and we will end the episode with a quick conclusion and a list of the sources. So, without any more interruptions, let's get into our second story. The following story is largely based off of the Virgin presented in the book Folklore of Scottish Locks and Springs by James M. Mackinlay, referencing a folktale from William Grant's Stewart's Highland Superstitions and Amusements. The murky, obscure depth of the Loch Ness were once known to harbor a noted demon steed that was a cause of terror to the inhabitants of the nearby land. Like other Kelpies, this creature constantly emerged, bedecked in dark reeds and sand, to trot along the roadside, all bridled and saddled, waiting for someone to mount his shimmering flank. When any unwary traveler did so, the Kelpie took to his heels and presently plunged into the deepest, blackest waters of Loch Ness with the victim on his back, their screams rippling the lake and traveling with the wind to the adjacent town. People shivered, but kept their heads down in a silent agreement to never acknowledge the creature. Predictably, tourism in the town declined, since traveling to a town where few returned from was less than appealing, to say the least, thus plunging the area into a state of poverty and isolation. Such events continued until one day a Highlander by the name of McGregor resolved to best the water horse, banishing its haunting presence 
from Loch Ness for good. For many years, the young man contemplated tactics to eradicate the Kelpie, preparing weapons and observing the actions and ability of his foe. One fateful misty morning, the Kelpie was prancing about, sauntering at the edges of the forest as usual. His black coat glistened and slid over his sleek form, though he was ignorant to the presence of McGregor camouflaged in the bushes, a short steel sword in his palm. The Kelpie was considerably startled when McGregor, sword in hand, leapt from the seemingly benevolent greenery and struck him a blow on the nose. The weapon cut through the bridle and the bit affixed to the Kelpie, both falling to the ground. The accessories were instantly picked up by McGregor, jumping out of the path of the frantic horse's hooves. McGregor was then able to observe that the bit and buckles were pure silver and the reins of soft and beautifully speckled leather. And from his constant surveillance of the Kelpie, McGregor had determined that the Kelpie was powerless without his saddle. As if to prove McGregor's speculations, The Kelpie requested to have his bit and saddle restored in coherent Gaelic, because, though a horse, this Kelpie had the power of human speech, and was able to converse with his conqueror, using varying arguments to bring about the restoration of his lost and vital property. very amusing mortal. Now return to me my rightful possessions. I think not. I have bested you, demon, and now your bridle will serve as my trophy. Finding that these arguments were unavailing, the Kelpie prophesied that McGregor would never enter his house with the bit in his possession. You assume great things, and yet you will never cross the threshold of your abode with it in your possession. Accept your fate and return what is mine. No. McGregor turned and fled through the forest in the direction of his home, the Kelpie disintegrating into water droplets that followed closely behind him on the wind. When McGregor arrived at the door, the Kelpie had already managed to overtake him and planted himself in front of the door to block the entrance, snarling and baring his sharp teeth. The Highlander, however, managed to outwit the Kelpie by going around to the back of his house, where he called for his wife who hastily came to the back window. McGregor flung the bit to her through the window. Returning to the Kelpie, he told the beast where the bit was and assured him that he would never get it back again. The Kelpie turned in astonishment and saw that there was a cross made from the wood and berries of the rowan tree hung above the door, intended to ward off witchcraft. Therefore, the demon steed could not enter the house, and presently departed, uttering certain exclamations of profanity that are not appropriate to mention. From then on, 
the Loch Ness Monster has been unable to cause much more trouble than the occasional surfacing or rippling of the lake water. Story and Creature or Fae Analysis Based on whichever interpretation is used, the Kelpie is described either as a magical creature or fairy, the hungry spirit of a body of water that takes the form of a horse, or even a demon in horse form. For the most part throughout this episode, We have predominantly followed the narrative of the Kelpie being presented as a fae, touching a bit on their spiritual aspects and their relationship to their habitat. Though this story offered a vivid introduction into the Kelpie as a demon. On all accounts, the Kelpie, or any water horse that we have discussed for that matter is portrayed as an insidious force to be reckoned with. And this is because water horses such as the Kelpie, Ek Ushka, Kabul Ushte, Achiska, and Nagel are representative of the more cruel and unforgiving aspects of nature. Their often dark coloring mirrors that of deep water, which is the most mysterious and haunting part of any water source. The Kelpie is not a lenient or playful figure in mythology because the feeling of overwhelm and quiet suffering that can accompany water is not a light and superficial thing. Roughly 320,000 deaths worldwide occur each year from drownings, most of which are children. And this statistic is not including related boating accidents. Maintaining the idea that a dark and malicious horse is waiting to drag you to your death is a metaphor for the inherent dangers that come with playing in water. We were not built for the element of water we have adapted to be able to withstand it, but only through a little while by swimming. It is too easy to be careless and ignorant when dealing with rivers, lakes, and even pools, leading to the cold and unrelenting grasp of the water pulling you under and ripping the breath from your lungs. even though it is a fact that many people can swim, it is still possible to be overtaken by this merciless form of nature. So, like many other fairies, the Kelpie was likely constructed as a justification and warning for drag drownings, especially the drownings of children who knew how to swim. Because if a person randomly died, people generally liked to blame it on the devil. And the Kelpie is a warning to prevent future deaths such as this. This horse comes bearing a very specific message to the world. 
that humans don't dominate everywhere and that it is in everyone's best interest to be wary of what lurks in the deep. Hello listeners, and welcome to my personal magic section, where I talk about how the creature or fairy of this and the previous episode have impacted me or how their ideas may be incorporated or may relate to my life. I'm going to start off by saying that the Kelpie is just such a well-known creature in mythology. And it has been referenced and incorporated into so many of the books that I have read. And I'm sure at least most of you can sympathize. It's pretty easy to tell that my absolute favorite genre of books is fantasy, <clears throat> fairy podcast. So I encounter a plethora of magical beings in what I read. But the Kelpies especially are a constant figure and have even been included in J.K. Rowling's Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, the book which is included in her mini-series that accompanies Harry Potter called The Hogwarts Library. According to the Ministry of Magic classifications for beasts, Kelpies are a level four, meaning that they are dangerous, require specialist knowledge, and can only be handled by skilled wizards. No muggles. Here is her description. Quote, This British and Irish water demon can take various shapes, though it most often appears as a horse with bull rushes for a mane. Having lured the unwary onto its back, it will dive straight to the bottom of its river, or lake, and devour the rider, letting the entrails float to the surface. The correct means to overcome a Kelpie is to get a bridle over its head with a placement charm, which renders it docile and unthreatening. The world's largest Kelpie is found in Loch Ness, Scotland. Its favorite form is that of a sea serpent, see page 38, and this reference is in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, just so this makes sense. This is not part of the quote, but anyway, we'll continue. International Confederation of Wizard Observers realized that they were not dealing with the true serpent when they saw it turn into an otter on the approach of a team of muggle investigators and then transform back into a serpent when the coast was clear. End quote. So Kelpies and the other water horses we've mentioned are also incredibly dark and brooding, which delineates them from other fairies. And they have yet to be made excessively whimsical and harmless by Disney. Well, yes, I realize there is a water horse depicted in Frozen 2, though even still, it is not of a particularly friendly and playful manner. And the actual horse in Frozen 2 is called the Noke. Look it up. It is a creature from Nordic 
mythology. But this being's blunt cruelty and murder are very realistic, I think, to the darkest sides of nature. The world isn't perfect, and the Kelpies are a stark reminder of that fact. Not everything bends to the will of humans, and not everything is in our control. Especially as a kid, we experience this. It is good to realize the beauty and wonder of a world that is still beyond our comprehension. Through the likes of fairies and unicorns. But to me, magic is also a representation of aspects of life that are startling, traumatic, and incredible in a surprising and dangerous way. So I'm really glad that the Kelpie acknowledges this. And with that, our episodes on Kelpies, the Ekushka, Kabul Ushte, Achuska, and Noggles have come to a close. I hoped you learned something about water horses, despite them being so prevalent in our modern world. Because I know I certainly learned a lot researching them. Please leave a rating and review on whatever podcasting source you are listening to this from. And you can contact me at ourveilofsmokinggold at gmail.com regarding any concerns, feedback, suggestions on theories, or anything else you want me to know. Especially if you see something wrong in a specific episode, or think I could supplement the episodes with more personal content or stories, compose an email, and I would cherish that email for all it would help me improve upon. Because... I am certainly not perfect. The sources for this episode and the previous episode include An Encyclopedia of Fairies by Catherine Briggs The World Guide to Gnomes, Fairies, Elves, and Other Little People by Thomas Cately Not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Please correct me if I'm wrong. The Fairy Bible by Teresa Mori. Abbey Lovers, Banshees, Boggarts by Catherine Briggs. The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries by Walter Yeeling Evans Wentz. Pictish Symbols, an article at lastofthedruids.com. The Kelpies, the main attraction at the Helix. Article at physicscotland.com. Let them eat horses. Article at silkroadfoundation.org. Folklore of Scottish Locks and Springs by James M. McInlay and Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them by J.K. Rowling. Also, follow us at our Instagram handle at Our Veil of Smoking Gold Podcast or on our Twitter handle at Our Veil. And our website is linked in the episode description. Once again, thank you to all of you guys who chose to listen to me talk. I'm Annalise, 
the host on Our Veil of Smoke and Gold podcast. Tune in next time for more on magic and fairies.